Hello and welcome to Money, Me and COVID-19, where we meet with business and investment leaders to understand the full impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. My guest today is a hugely successful entrepreneur. He left school at 15, built up one of the country's biggest accounting practices, and then sold it for more than 80 million pounds. His autobiography is called How to Make Millions Without a Degree. And these days, he makes lots of investments in startup businesses, much of it done on the Twitter platform, so he's become known as the Twitter Dragon. He's also a very successful racing driver. He's won his class in the Le Mans 24-hour race and won the European Le Mans Championship. But perhaps most relevant for us today is that he's the one who's mounting a legal challenge against a government's lockdown program. His name is Simon Dolan. Simon, welcome to the program. Hi, Grant. Nice to see you. Well, before we talk about the legal challenge itself, just, just tell me about some of the businesses that you still you know, own and, and what the kind of impact of lockdown has been on them. It varies, really. Um, so my businesses range for, for all sorts of different things. So there's no particular common thread. And it literally runs from uh, aviation all the way through the alphabet, pretty much to women's tights at the other end. Um, and evidently, they're affected in different ways. You know, So aviation has been really hit hard. Um, for all the reasons that you see, um, I mean, we're we, you know we're not like Virgin and sell seats. But for example, we uh, we ferry the uh, football teams around, so we eight or nine Premiership football clubs use us um, to get to their matches and so on. Well, evident football's been cancelled, so they're not going anywhere. So with planes, they're really expensive things to be sat on the ground doing nothing. So uh, that's been that's been badly affected. Um, other things more or less, you know, it just depends on how well the businesses have been set up and, and what it is that they do, you know, so a software company that, that I invested in, uh, it's kind of all right, you know, it, it's, it's getting by. My, my worry is not so much the immediate impact of this, it's going to be 12 months down the line or 18 months down the line, I think that's what people are not really realising. Um, so, uh, you know, if, if you had me on here in two years' time, it might be a different story. Well, yes. I mean, I think just today I've seen that the uh, the first quarter figures have been announced, which have only taken into account one week of lockdown. And already, though, that quarter takes us back to the worst one since 2008. Can you imagine what quarter two's figures are going to look like? I see the same thing. The GDP drop, I think it was 5.8%, which is the, the biggest drop since they started measuring it. Um, and to put that into, into pound terms, I think it's 10, 10 or 12 billion pounds. Of GDP drop and then when you add to that the 10 or 12 billion pounds that they're spending on furlough you know, so this is not money that they're putting in loans this is money that the government are giving you um, that's 20 billion a month and as you say this was in a, in a, in a fairly uh, in a fairly tame month of March April as you say you've got to think that the GDP is going to be down 10 percent for sure yeah, and, and, and of course, we don't have a government that's uh, made up of lots of uh, business owners, but I, I read a recent survey from America of I think 6,000 SMEs, where on average, they had less than a month's cash in hand. And unless you've ever run a small business, you just don't know what the pressures are. But <clears throat> I suspect there's a lot of British SME businesses that are absolutely teetering on the brink at the moment. And, and People have no idea that this, this kind of domino effect is going to start taking thousands of companies just out of existence. Yeah, and I think it's cash flow that's going to kill them. I don't actually, you know, profitability. You can, you, you got to, your starting point was, was that you had a profitable business um, and you gave people credit. Um, and then the whole virus lockdown thing came. And then all of a sudden, most of those people just stopped paying. You know, so landlords is a really good example, but there's thousands of others. And if people stop paying you whilst you're still profitable, you haven't got the cash in the bank. You know, we all know the difference between profit and cash flow. Um, and that cash flow will never, you know, it's never going to come back. And maybe, you know, if businesses are starting to get back on their feet in 12 months' time, all of these loans that they've been forced to take on by the government shutting them down need to be repaid. And it's all very well saying, well, they're going to be you know, interest-free for the first year and no capital repayments. And then it's only going to be 2.5% interest at the end of that. You've still got to pay it back. You know? And this is a, a significant chunk of money that most people are borrowing, which they now have to pay out of businesses that have been decimated, um, maybe just about got back on their feet, 
and then I have to pay a big lump of loan back for something that really wasn't their fault. And, uh, you know, it, it brings us on to, to, to the case, I guess. But I, I, I really do believe that what the government have done is illegal. And if it turns out that what the government have done is illegal, that has huge ramifications then uh, going forwards in terms of all these loans that they forced people to take out. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's a wide problem and it's only getting bigger. You know, the more the government prevaricate, the worse it gets. Yeah, and, and, and I think that there the, the tends to be this sort of uh, um, almost a competitive locking down in Western governments when one started doing it, the others wanted to be seen to be doing the same thing. And yet, you know, not every country has had to react in this way. So you know, that there is more than one way to deal with this pandemic. And some countries like South Korea and Sweden and so on have taken a different approach and, and seem to have uh, actually come out of it with better statistics than, than Britain. So, so one of the things that galls me is this idea that we're somehow following the science and, and hiding political decisions behind supposed science. Uh, 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 you know, what, what's your take on, on how this government has reacted versus you know, the way some other countries? Uh, first of all, I think the governments, all governments have been in a very difficult situation. Um, and um, I think almost whatever they did, they were going to get hammered. And it's not, it, what's interesting is it's not even really a right or left thing. You know, most political things are either right wing or you're left wing. That doesn't even seem to be, in fact, I think to a, a lot of the cases have actually been reversed. Um, but yeah, I'm quite firmly of the mind that actually it didn't really matter what governments did. The outcomes seem to be pretty much the same. And indeed, there, there, there is an, it seems to be an inverse correlation between the severity of lockdown and the amount of people that have died, you know, if, we, if we say deaths per million. Uh, so you look at Italy and Spain and France and the UK, you know, pretty, pretty vigorous lockdowns for all of them, and yet the highest rates of death. Obviously, then you go to Sweden and you say, well, actually, Sweden had no lockdown to speak of. Uh, they were just a bit sensible. And, uh, and they've had, relatively speaking, uh, lower uh, uh, deaths. Um, but then you compare Sweden to Denmark and Norway, and they had even fewer deaths, but they did have lockdown. I'm not so sure that there's actually anything that anybody did that made any difference whatsoever. And when, you know, truth be told, when you look at all the charts and the graphs, you know, those curves, they all end up pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. So I think it's probably got far more to do with where you live, uh, you know, how much you weigh, what pre-existing conditions you've got, how old you are, whether you see the sunlight, um, you know, or, or you're in, you know, you've been through a winter, for example, in England, where there's not been much sun. Um, you know, in the Côte d'Azur, I, I live in Monaco, and there's been barely any cases at all in the entire Côte d'Azur. Well, it's really sunny here, you know, so maybe there's a link between that and vitamin D. And I think it's a little bit like the weather, you know. There are, there's a million, probably more than that, different factors involved in this. And humans are very arrogant and think that the actions that they take actually have some sort of an outcome. And, uh, and it's a bit like, you know, in the old days where they used to, I don't know, sacrifice a virgin on a rock to make sure that they got great crops the next year. And then when they got great crops the next year, they said, see, we had to do that. Imagine if we'd not done it. Yeah. <laughs> that's, where, that's where we're at. That's obviously the missing strategy that Boris hasn't come up with yet. But um, yeah, what, what, was it, <laughs> what was it that actually, you know, it's one thing to, to have this kind of discussion about it, but obviously something must have really kind of got under your skin to drive you to the point of wanting to take this legal action. So what was the chain of events that led up to you, you know, triggering the actual legal challenge? It was, it was fairly basic, to be honest with you. Um, I, I'd been mulling it over in my head just thinking to myself, well, it, you know, basically it's not right. So you could see that, and, but then you kind of think, well, you know, what can you do? You know, there's not a huge amount that you can do against the government. And, uh, you know, you can write to your MP or you can protest, well, not anymore. Maybe you can do a petition or something. So it was just mulling around in my head. And then I happened to read an article by, uh, by a barrister. And it just, it was in one of the newspapers and I saw it. And, uh, and he said, well, he, he believes that, you know, that, Central for a judicial review, and it was illegal. So I just got in touch with him and said, well, you know, what do you think? And do you fancy it? And that was where it started. And that was only uh, 12, 13 days ago now. Uh, and I think there are, there are two or three elements to the challenge, aren't there? Do you want to just talk us through the specific points on which you are making the challenge? 
Well, there's three elements to it. The first is a technical legal thing, which is whether they acted ultra virus, I think, which is beyond me. I don't really understand it. I guess I think it means that they're acting outside of the law. Um, but this, the, the ones that are more relevant to me are basically have what is what they have done in, in proportion to the threat. Now, at the time, you could say, well, maybe it was. But now there isn't an expert in the world anywhere that would agree that what the government is doing is proportional to the actual threat. So that's an interesting one, I think. Um, and then the third one is, is whether it's basically an infringement of a basic English right, which is the right to enjoy private property uh, peacefully. So they're, they're, the three, they're the three tenets that we're going up. Okay. And, and, you know, one of the things that when you think of the legal system, you think of a, a very slow moving machine, especially at a time like this with, you know, courts being cancelled and so on. Uh, how, how time is of the essence here? How quickly can this get to some kind of outcome? Well, so uh, I was amazed, actually, because, yeah, yeah, I've been involved in a few cases before and they just torture us the amount of time they take. Um, but with judicial reviews, and because it's such a, um, an important point, it actually happens very quickly. So we'll get a reply from the government to our initial letter. We'll, we'll get that uh, tomorrow. So that's, well, maybe 14, um, which is the maximum amount of time that they had to respond. And they have to reply substantively. So there has to be a complete uh, rebuttal against our case. Um, and then when we see that, digest that, and then we take them to court. Um, and then we'll, we take them to court, uh, you know, probably uh, sometime toward the end of May, I guess it will be, we'll have a date, and then that will be when we, when we have a fight. So it actually moves very, very quickly. Okay, and the fact you've been able to raise over a hundred thousand pounds suggests that Britain's entrepreneurs are very much, you know, behind this, and they want some answers as well. Yeah, this is this is interesting. So the whole the whole crowdfunding thing. When I when I initially spoke to the barrister, um, it was just going to be me funding it, and that that was that. It was what I was happy to do. You know, I could afford to do it. So. Um, and then uh, the barrister said, "Oh, somebody else has been in touch." a lady called Erica, and uh, she wants to basically, you know, put some money in and go and, and sort of be involved. So I spoke to her, and so we agreed both to put some money in. Um, and then the lawyer who's now involved at this stage, he says, uh, you know, if people want to make donations, they can't really make it straight through us because we haven't got the capacity to deal with it. So he said, why don't you set up a crowd justice page? And I've never heard of that before. I've heard of crowdfunding, but not the crowd justice. So um, we just set it up on the... Just, just really out of the idea that, you know, if people wanted to join in, they could. And, th and that was that. And then, of course, people uh, started to get behind it. So as of May 12th, uh, we've had 3,500 separate people donate on there. Um, and, you, and you say about entrepreneurs, yeah, there's been a few big donations on there. Um, but there's an awful lot of them, you know, sort of five and ten pounds. And they're the real heartwarming ones. You know, there's, there's various comments on there, but there's some that are saying, look, you know, I really can't afford to do this, but I don't see that we've got any choice. You know, we have to fight back in some way. Or I'm on benefits. I'm sorry I can't afford to put any more in, but, you know, I want to feel as I'm fighting. So it's, it, it's certainly not business people predominantly. Um, it's more, I, I hate to use the word, but it's more just ordinary people who just want to get their lives back and fed up with the government telling them what to do. That's very interesting because I'm also sensing um, a bit of kind of lockdown fatigue and, and, a, and a giving up of compliance. So, for example, I, I live in Weybridge and some dork in Elmbridge Borough Council decided that one way of enforcing lockdown was to dump four great big skips full of rubble to block a car park at a local beauty spot near here by the river. And for the last five or six weeks, everyone's been very good children. They've not gone near there. Then just this last weekend, I noticed there was a whole line of cars parked on the road where they couldn't get in the car park. And it was almost like people were giving a bit of a V side to the council saying, look, you know, we've had enough of this. We want to get our lives back. I just wonder if you're catching a bit of zeitgeist here with this challenge. I think the timing was very good. You know, we, do, we probably, if we'd have done it a week earlier, I don't think it would have gained any traction whatsoever and I probably would have got slated. And even over the course of the campaign, so when I first started it, I used to get, there was a lot of hate mail coming through, you know, on, the, on various media. Um, and then just our last four or five days, I guess, that's kind of all gone away. You know, there, there's very, very few now. So out of, 
you know, however many messages that we get in hundreds a day, there's, there's maybe half a percent or something now that are actually saying, you know, the various insults. Um, so there has been a sweep. There definitely has been a sweep. And now, you know, I think what the government have done by releasing this really vague, it's odd, it's, you know, in one, in one respect, Boris is saying, well, just use common sense and you can go to the park and do this and do that. And uh, just common sense, it's easy. And then on the other side of it, they've issued a 60 page guidance for what should be common sense. And it's so vague, you know, it's so vague as to be nonsensical, but then that's obviously by design because what the government are then doing is is saying, well, you know, there's our guidance and then they leave it up to the police. Now the police, of course, are on a hiding for nothing. So on the one side, they've got their boss saying, you know, you need to make sure people stay two meters apart. And then you've got your local copper, most of whom are quite reasonable people who are having to go up and measure whether people are two meters apart, you know, at what point? And of course you, you, you know, you then get the little Hitler types um, who last week were probably on um, radar gun patrol and now they've got some real power and they can tell people to stay away from one another, you know? So uh, I, I do, I do feel sorry, sorry for the police. And I think it's an abdication by the government of, of what they should be doing, which is being decisive and, and clear. Yeah, and, and I think for me, one of the challenges here is if you go back to say 2008, that was when they let the kind of QE money printing genie out of the bottle. And of course that's never gone back and is now you know, bigger than ever. Now they've let this kind of lockdown genie out of the bottle. I can't imagine it's going to go back in. I, I, I just wonder, you know, when they'll next start resorting to these sort of measures. And you're know, from a kind of almost the, the human rights aspect of your challenge. This really does, to me, need to be clarified as to under what grounds you can effectively impose martial law and put everyone under house arrest. Uh, this is one of the reasons the case is so important. It, it's not so much about what's happening now. It's about what potentially it, it sets a precedent for in the future. Because this bill that they put in, uh, that lasts for two years. It doesn't automatically end after two years. It lasts for two years. So that means if, if the government win in the judicial review, it means that you can be locked up at any time they wish for no reason whatsoever, at any time within the next two years. And we know that once the, once the law is on, uh, on the books, it's not going off. You know, in two years time, there'll be another reason. What's the bet? there'll be another really bad virus coming from China or somewhere in two years time. It means they have to extend it just for the public safety, just for the good of everybody. And, and, and if you're a, a, a businessman, you know, trying to make, let's say, a multi-million pound investment to rebuild a business that's been damaged by COVID-19, if you're in the back of your mind, you're thinking they could do this again next year. Are you going to make that investment? Well, it would depend what you're investing in. You know, you've got to be thinking, well, the only things I would invest in now would be some kind of healthcare um, market. You know, I think healthcare is going to go crazy after this. Um, so there'd be all those things. And then, you know, enabling people to work at home. Yeah, that's been, on the one hand, you know, if, if we didn't have the internet, then you couldn't work at home. It would be a complete, even more of a disaster than it is. You know? But if we didn't have the internet, we wouldn't be in lockdown anyway because the ridiculous messaging wouldn't have got around quite so virally. Um, excuse the pun. So um, yeah, I, in terms of investments, you know, there are still good, there are still good businesses out there, and there will still be good businesses out there. But you know, I certainly wouldn't want to be in hospitality or. commercial property. I wouldn't want to be selling my house. You know, I, I wouldn't want to have any kind of shops or retail or anything like that. It's, that's, you can't see that coming back. I really can't. No. So, so, so um, uh, from a, a sort of business owner point of view, is there any advice you could offer to uh, people who are you know, wondering how to, to deal with the next few months and how, how, how to uh, you know, get their business through this from, from what you're doing with your other companies? Is there any advice you could offer for, you know, COVID-19 survival tactics? Well, I mean, it's cutting everything, it's just the simple stuff, but cutting everything down to the bone. You know, there's no, you, you just can't keep people on out of sympathy or some sense of duty. Or you can, but eventually the money runs out and then, of course, no one's got a job. Um, so that's the sad reality and the sad truth of that. You know, negotiate the hell out of everything if you've got any kind of premises costs, um, which I'm sure people are already doing. And then just investigating how the technology can work. You know, how can you work from home? Um, if you have got retail, you know, hopefully you're already online anyway. Um, how do you how do you actually um, 
uh, you know, message your customers now. Hopefully you've got a database of people that you can maybe message out to and get out to. Um, and then, you know, how do you, I think he said he's, he's going to be starting opening shops in July or something like that. What does your shop actually look like? You know, in my mind, if you've got a small shop on a high street and customers have got to stay two meters apart, how can you, I don't see how you can exist. I really don't. Um, so then, then really careful, you know, really carefully, you have to think about, well, is this, is this a viable business at all? And you have to take a really hard look at it. And if you believe that it isn't, then you've just got to can it uh, and then move on and do something else, you know, get online, at least use the lockdown time for something that could be useful going forward. But we just have to accept that there's been an enormous change in the way the world works and it ain't going back. Okay, so, so imagine that you know, in a parallel universe somewhere, there's been a snap general election and Simon Dolan has been elected Prime Minister of Great Britain. What, what would you do differently to what you're seeing at the moment? I'd open up immediately. You know, it, it's very, it, very difficult to, well, it's very easy with hindsight to say what they should have done. And I'm sure if I'd been in Boris's position, pressured to death to do some lockdown, you know, just to do something, I would have done the same thing. Let's face it, I think we all would. Um, but now, you know, you've got to look at it, especially with Ferguson being completely discredited and all the science being discredited. You've got to hold your hands up and go, look, uh, we didn't handle it as best we could, but we're now opening and uh, we'll do whatever we can to try and keep it going. But to, con you know, to continue with this sort of pseudo science of, um, you know, these are our 60 pages of rules about how we can trade and how we can get out and all the rest of it. It's just a nonsense. There's no science behind it. It's a document written by a committee of 50 which indeed it was um, and we all know what they say about committees so yeah it takes some leadership um, he's got a hard job but then that's why he's running the country it's a hard job you know it's not all going around and giving these vague speeches and waving your hands and being a bit of a buffoon on television sometimes there's hard stuff to do uh, and I'm afraid you know it doesn't seem as though he's up for it now Okay, uh, and so, so as we come to the end of our, of our time together, uh, Simon, what, what, what are your thoughts on, you know, we hear all sorts of people talking about V-shaped recoveries and U-shaped recoveries. H how do you see this panning out over the coming months and years and, and, and you know, t in terms of the total impact and how we are actually going to gradually recover from it? Well, human beings do recover and businesses do recover. Um, you know, the human spirit's pretty tough. I don't think that will be knocked out of everybody, but I, I really can't see a recovery in, you know, in the medium term. I've, I've got, you've got to think that the, if things have fallen off a cliff and I would imagine it would just, it would just flatline. You've got zombie companies, you've got zombie sole traders now that are going around, you know, people who can just about afford um, to keep going but they're not going to be able to offer much in the way of jobs, employment, you know, wage, wages are going to go down for sure because it's a downward drive on, on, on demand and that will affect, and no one's going to have much money to spend. You know, it's a pretty vicious um, cycle that they're in. Um, you know, the, the money that the UK is printing, well, so it needs to be accounted for in some way, even if not repaid. Um, so you've got to look at austerity measures, measures I would imagine for the next 20 years. I don't know, you know, how the austerity measures that they put in so far, I think, have gone on for 12 years and they've blown the entire savings in the last two months. Yeah, that says how big this is. And so um, I, I think it would be, I don't know if there's a shape for it, but I just see it flatlining. You know, you'd think Japan, I guess, but probably worse. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, it's, it's, it's really difficult. I, mean, I think we're all natural, entre uh, as entrepreneurs, we're natural optimists, but it's really well, well, you know, the one, uh, the one sign of, uh, the one kind of spark of optimism maybe to take away is, is that, you know, in, in recessions, there's plenty of people that make money. And in boom times, there's plenty of people that go bankrupt. So, you know, it's never a good time to start a business. Um, and it's never really a bad time to start a business. It's just the time that you have. So, you know, make the best of what you have. And, you know, this is what we have at the moment. So we make the best of it. And I guarantee people will make millions out of this. It's just been different markets maybe than what we're used to and different sectors. So uh, okay, well, there, there, is, there is optimism. It's just change. 
you yeah. know, the old who moved my cheese thing in it, which I'm sure everybody has, uh, has read. Um, that's one of those big moments. There's a lot of people, uh, a lot of people there with their trainers over their shoulders at the moment, staring at the wall going, well, it used to be here, it used to be here. Okay, well, a hint of optimism to end on there. So, uh, Simon Dell, thanks for joining us from Monaco today and all the best with your legal challenge. Thank you very much, man. Thank you.